A few weeks ago, the chief correspondent of the BBC, John Simpson, who I'm sure you all know, uh, said uh, in his lifetime he'd never seen so many conflicts around the world. What he didn't say was that the result of those conflicts was that hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced and also became refugees. What I'm going to do this afternoon is say a little bit about how the agencies uh, are supporting those people and people of all sorts of uh, large-scale emergencies, and very specifically about WASH. What's WASH? It's water, sanitation and hygiene. And it's about the agencies and how they are coordinated um, into how they respond to these emergencies. And that coordination today is called the cluster approach. Um, and as we go through my presentation, I'm going to say about how and where this cluster approach came and how it came into being. Um, I'm not going to go through these statistics because you know these statistics. In fact, these statistics are wrong because actually what's happening on a daily basis is increasing these statistics. I mean, even, even yesterday, the Lebanese government said it's putting a barrier up to stop refugees from Syria coming in. So, in fact, whatever statistics you put up on the board, they're wrong these days because it, 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 it doesn't meet the numbers of people which are happening. So I'm going to talk about water and sanitation, but water and sanitation very specifically as emergency wash. I'm also going to say a little bit about, first of all, about what water and sanitation is about in the context, because we take it for granted. We don't, at this time, sanitation is about what we do in the, you know, just go to a loo and pour the flush. It's not about that support. And of course, we also think that emergency water is the answer. If you give people clean water, it's all over. But of course, it isn't, even though this is one of my favorite pictures. It's about, you know, a lady pouring some clean water. But of course, water and sanitation and hygiene is about promotion of health. It's about actually improving people's health. And of course, it's focused very specifically in, in almost all emergencies on mothers and children, even though it's not all about mothers and just mothers and children. It's about adults and fathers and men as well. But WASH and children's health is extremely important because one and a half million people die in a non-emergency situation every year through diarrhea, through bad water and sanitation. And as Patrick mentioned right this morning, he mentioned the Millennium Goals. One of those goals, um, which is not going to be met next year, Target 10, is about the provision of water and sanitation globally in a, in, in a development situation of which the, sa the sanitation goals are not going to be met. And they're not going to be met probably until 2013, 2050. So what is this water business? What, why is it so important? Well, it's, it's not only about your drink, but water is classified as about how you drink. It's classified in, in, in water availability for washing. And if you don't have enough, you'll have washing diseases, wash diseases. And if you're living near water, you're going to have malarias and, and dirty environments and other things. So water is a very, very important element in terms of things. And it has so many linkages. Linkages to, to health, uh, HIV, and nutrition is, is, is a key linkage in water. Linkage to education. You might say, well, education is nothing about water. In most developing countries, if you don't provide water in schools, wash in schools, you find that girls and female teachers at certain times of the month and lots of times don't go to school. So wash in schools is very, very important. And of course, it's about poverty. There's millions, five, five and a half billion people living in poverty. You provide good, clean water and sanitation and hygiene, and you remove and bring people gradually out of poverty. And of course, it's a gender issue as well, because in most situations, whether it's emergency or non-emergency, girls are actually carrying water. But the situations we're talking about is this situation. You saw this on your television last week. This is about this town inside of the Syrian uh, Turkish border, uh, the, the Kurdish town. And it's about all sorts of emergencies. You remember Libya a few years ago, people coming out of Libya. You remember just a few weeks ago, this particular situation between the Israelis and Hamas in Gaza. So it's, it's a crisis which is on, but of course, 
major, develop, major emergency crisis, not just about conflict. It might be about, in this case, about a cyclone. This was actually taken just before the earthquake in Haiti, uh, when the second city was devastated by two and a half metres of mud coming through in a cyclone. Or it might even be the opposite. Lots of parts of East Africa every year goes into a very serious drought situation where even the cows and the things don't survive in that. So it's, not, it's about whether you've got too much or whether it's not about not having enough. And it's also about, of course, the large-scale emergencies that we all know about, the Haiti earthquake, which we see on our televisions every day. And, uh, things. But I want to just take you back just quickly to where, where the wash water world came in uh, and, and started to move. Almost, you might say, using a pun, a watershed moment. This is actually in the Rwandan genocide, when 400,000 refugees moved across from Rwanda into, in, into Tanzania. They also moved into Goma. But this, and these people um, around. And the agencies uh, responded to that very quickly. And they responded very specifically a lot of the time in water. And it was that response in water and not in so much in sanitation and not so much in hygiene that actually was recognised by the agencies and became a point when something happened and the discussion from, from the Great Lakes Crisis, as it was called, came a thing called Sphere, a Sphere project, which actually looked at minimum standards in humanitarian relief, how agencies, what amounts of water, what amounts of sanitation, what sort of distances and quantities and... Uh, security things that people are, are connected to. And it provided key indicators, which the agencies today follow, those key indicators. In water, 20 litres per person or 15 litres per person per day. It, it's a sort of... In, in sanitation, it also supports... Probably one of the key indicators out, out of the sanitation side was actually female toilet and washing areas and where you cite them. The biggest rapes in the world are done when people are displaced into camps and washing areas for women are badly cited and, people, and they get raped. It's one of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees' biggest problems. So the Sphere, pro the Sphere project developed and in 1997 in, in, uh, was uh, developed by the, lots of the NGOs and the Red Cross movement and was accepted after three or four years by governments, by donors, uh, by most of the agencies. So that was a sort of like a a key moment on where things have changed so that water sanitation actually became wash. And from that point, wash is the main, the main use of the word wash came out. But of course, there was another key moment, um, and this is Darfur in 2003-2004. You may, some of you may remember that. And of course, what you will remember is the, the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, what happened there. Both those things... Another, another issue came up very clearly from that, and that was how the agencies worked together and how they were coordinated. In Sri Lanka, for example, I was in Sri Lanka for that first part of the, of the tsunami, and the coordination was unbelievable. It was just a complete mess. There was loads of money, people spending things, agencies coming in, doing all their own thing. And it clearly was not the way to go forward. Now, one of the things which happened at that time... The United Nations, in one of its better moments, um, under a committee called the IASC, which is the Agencies Committee, which is all the main UN agencies, and the Red Cross movements and the NGO movements all together, they identified that the coordination side was appalling. The NGOs weren't working with the UN, and the UN weren't working with the donors, and the donors weren't working. So there's a lot of things to do. And from that came the humanitarian reform agenda which was actually how you build a much stronger, predictable approach towards responding to emergencies. And from that agenda came a whole range of approaches about international finance and about the coordination of the, of the UN in country, but the cluster approach. The cluster approach was about specific areas, health, nutrition, shelter, uh, security. All those areas, and water and sanitation, needed to be brought together 
so that the agencies and the UN and the donors work together. And specific agencies were given, the UN agencies, and in water and sanitation, it was UNICEF that was given the mandate to bring together the NGOs, the donors and what have you, into a coordinated body. That body today operates in Syria, it operates in every emergency emergency that you've seen on your television since 2006. And it's about the NGOs, There's it's not just about those NGOs, it's about uh, you know, a lot of NGOs in the market. It's about the Red Cross movement, it's about the UN, it's about consortiums, about uh, institutions like CDC, and it's about the donors. These people meet when there's a global meeting of the WASH cluster, all those people meet together. And they bring that, and it's about the cluster approach. So the, the cluster approach is happening right now in Syria. It's happening right now for the Ebola crisis. It's happening right now in South Sudan. It's happening right now in every major crisis you see around the world. What do we do? What do we do? We're talking about water uh, for drinking and washing, first of all. And this is where uh, we're, talk we're talking about provision of tankered water and talking about standards we do bring, bring in together. And it's about maybe providing... Uh, Pillow tanks is maybe providing equipment, but it's about the provision of adequate uh, amounts of controlled uh, security in water. And in some of the more difficult places in Darfur, uh, out in the desert, we think, you know, where water is really the key to life, if you don't have water in Darfur, you die. It's not about food, it's not about shelter, it's about water. So their water is very important and it's about you know, when people come together, they come collectively. Of course, it's not only about in the desert, it's about everywhere. It's about in the urban situation. This is in Kosovo, in Eastern Europe, when we had this crisis together there. And, of course, we think all the time about camps. This is some of the camps in the Great Lakes crisis. Uh, this is in Burundi and, and big camps. We talk about big camps that we see now in, in, in Syria. In Goma, there were a million people. This particular camp has over 300,000, and it's 10 kilometers long. It's about huge numbers and about a, a huge response. But of course, it's not only about 10, 15 years ago, it's about today, and this photograph is what's happening today in Jordan for the Syrian refugees which are coming in. Um, provision, doing the same type of approach, making sure you've got adequate storages of water, what have you, and Syrian refugees which are coming across the border, all the time into these camps and that they have some means of, 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 uh, of, of water, that, which is a survival because it's all sort of deserty areas. Sanitation, let me say a little bit about sanitation. Um, the uh, medical journals, and a lot of you are medics, the medical journals of Lancet and the, the British Medical Journal, both in, in, in 2007 cited sanitation as most effective means of public health for the intervention that the international community has. And that the uh, British, medical voted, British Medical Journal voted sanitation is the greatest medical milestone since 1840. So when we're talking about sanitation, we're talking about something very, very important to the survival of those people. And it may be quite simple, straightforward, like this, sort of pits, holes in the ground, but it needs to be controlled in Haiti, uh, in, in, in that sort of environment. It was very, very quickly done with simple latrines, first of all, but they grew into more sophisticated uh, and controlled latrines. In Sichuan, in, in, in the Chinese uh, earthquake, where most of us didn't have access, I, I had more access than, than what most people have, uh, the Chinese army put in really sophisticated chemical toilets um, because they, even they understood that it was important. But of course, we also learned what is really important is hygiene and how you get hygiene over and how you change people's habits and how you change things. So hygiene promotion is very, very important and it's seen as a part of WASH and that's why the H in WASH is hygiene and it's important. Connected to that a lot is about the hand washing of soap. Um, or hand washing with soap and we know about that because we do it ourselves. Well, some of us do. Um, you, what you may not know was that last Wednesday was a global hand washing day. Since 2008, there has been a global hand washing day, and that is celebrated globally, not so much in this country because we don't sort of see 
hygiene so much in this country, even though it's getting more important in hospitals and getting more important in areas. And we see hygiene now in every, every part of, of our society. And of course, hygiene is about the promotional side. And it's about making sure that your messages come right. This is in Haiti. If you've been to Haiti, the, the Haitians are great artists. They're fantastic artists. So you use those skills that they've got available. Very graphic types of uh, uh, very uh, you know, down-to-earth paintings about you know, its greeter and what have you. Culturally specific for Haiti, you wouldn't use this in Pakistan, in, in, in an Islamic community. They would be very, very offended by that. But then you wouldn't get the same sorts of artists and the same sort of thing. So you have to use what is appropriate and what culturally fits in. And it may well be a softer approach like this in terms of hygiene messaging using uh, uh, ranges of, uh, uh, of, 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 of umbrellas and children and schools and what have you. But there are challenges now. And of course, those big challenges are about how we do things in the urban environment and how the politics of urban environment, and it might be floods and in the urban side, which is also very effective. Uh, and and in, in the Philippines a few years ago, almost a million families were affected really badly by, by that. And of course, in, in Baghdad, in the, in the war, issues of, of, of working in the urban environment and the urban sector now is a very, very big focus. And of course, in the urban focus, it's also about slums. This is in Freetown. Um, and you see that problems of how the next photograph I go, this photograph is actually 100 meters away from the Connaught Hospital, where the biggest outbreak of, of Ebola is going taking place. It's 100 meters away. So you can see the public health problem that you've got around the hospital in Freetown when you've got slums all the way around it. But of course, Less of us agencies that are responding on the ground, we need ways and means and new solutions to do things. And it may be that in the old days, we actually had, you know, we developed equipment to do that. And we put that equipment in stock and we put it in storages and areas and what have you. In the big, in, in the big emergencies now, we have a lot of innovation in sanitation, particularly with, you know, female urinals and, and uh, harvesting and hand washing stuff, um, composting whole range of different things, how we approach sanitation in a much more uh, innovative way now, because it's one of the key things. And then there are agencies now that are developing specifically to see how we respond to, to, to those challenges, this Field Ready group, where they're talking about developing and using things like 3D printing to print yourself or small-scale in injection moulding on site to be able to produce you the sort of equipment that you need. And you see this type of stuff in it beginning to appear in the field when you're operating. But of course, the world's changing. You see this very much on your screens every day. And now the humanitarian space, which was used to be just agencies, is now military, it's commercial companies, it's international military, it's private security companies. So the international space is now covered very widely. But what is very clear um, uh, about the humanitarian space and the humanitarian agencies today, it's extremely dangerous. And I'm going to leave it like that. And thank you very much for listening.